17. So Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. We're going to start reading in verse number 26. So Luke 17, verse 26. We will read down to 33. We will read responsibly. Uh, please tonight. So Luke 17, verse 26. The Bible says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be, uh, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man together. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. And let's pray. Thank you again, Lord, for another opportunity that we have to, uh, to open your word, to uh, look at what you've given us about the future. And God, thank you that we have a pastor that's willing that has been willing to and has put many, many hours, days, weeks into this study. Please do be with him as he preaches and every one of us as we listen. Meet with us in a special way, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
still goes by the cross You can live as you please But you must pay the cost And the highway to heaven Still goes by the cross Thank you for that. We are, we've been in our series on Revelation. <clears throat> Tonight, before we get into chapter 6, I want us to look at these verses. They're not officially part of Revelation, but what it's talking about, <clears throat> what it's talking about is, is a part of the whole end times uh, scenario. Um, the end times, as we have looked at them, are very, very important that we understand them. Uh, they are a big deal. And they should be a big deal. Um, sometimes people think, well, what's the big, what, what's, what is it all about? You know, after all, don't we just escape all that's coming and we just got out of here and, 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 you know, it's not a big deal. Yes, but if we understand all the truths of the, the, um, the rapture, it will make, in, in the end times, it will make a difference in our lives. You cannot look at the end times and you look at what God is going to do for us and not gain a greater appreciation for our salvation. And that we really, if we look at it, when God is judging the earth, he is just in all that he does. When God judges sin, he is just in judging sin. That is why Christ had to die for our sins so that the price could be paid because he would not have been just if there would have been a price and he would have kind of just bypassed it. God demanded a price. It was paid. We gain of understanding of God's righteous judgment, as I mentioned. God is righteous. See, he's, God's not like us. When we're judgmental, you know, well, you know, God is right and God is holy, sinless. And so God cannot stand sin in his presence. That's why our sin had to be dealt with. And so if God uh, 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 judges sin, God is just doing what he has a right to do. If someone is found guilty in the court of law, after, that, after the, the verdict has come down, the next phase is the judge comes and passes sentence. The judge has a right to pass sentence because they've already been found guilty. You can't, uh, you can't do it on someone that's innocent. He has, he's in that position. He has a right. God has a right to judge this earth and judge sin. Also, if we understand the end times, we get an understanding of the need of the law. Some of the judgments we read about, and when we look at the, the final judgment, the, the, uh, you know, the great white throne, that's horrific. That's bad. That is not good. And that helps us to gain compassion for those who don't know Jesus Christ because that is where they're headed. And that is their destiny and that is their future unless someone intervenes and shares the gospel with them and they trust Christ. We gain an understanding of that. We gain an understanding of the closeness of eternity. The things that are coming are coming soon. This world is headed that way. We look at the craziness of this world and, and like how come people just can't see things? It's just, it's just common stuff to us that's common sense. The news makes it sound like it's, it, you're, it's, it's, you're an idiot if you don't see it the opposite direction. And it's like, is everybody losing their mind? Well, that's because things are coming to a sudden end. They're, it's coming, and they'll be prepared for the end time. And really, if we understand the, the coming of Christ, we get an understanding of our accountability to God. You know, we, we oh, I believe in heaven. I believe in all about, okay, that's great. Have you ever stopped and thought about you're going to stand before God someday? Not for our sin, by the way. You know, we're not going to stand in front of God and say, hey, that's my buddy. He'll judge our works. Now again, praise God our sin's not going to be judged. But it's going to be an awesome thing to stand in front of God. You're going to see, we, all, we saw a few of the scenes already in heaven. They see God and it's holy, holy, holy. Thou art worthy. We're going to, we're going to completely understand him for who he really is. And we're going to understand our accountability. But most importantly, we'll get an understanding of how we are to live differently in this world. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, they say this, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of our God, wherein the heavens shall, be, being on fire, shall be dissolved, 
and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, which dwelleth righteousness. And that's at the very end. Wherefore, beloved, in verse 14 of, of 2 Peter 3, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, these end time th things that are coming, be diligent that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. When we, when we understand all that's coming, this world is going, to be, is going to be ended. There'll be a new heavens and a new earth. And eternity will begin. When we think about that, it helps us to live without spot and blood. It helps us to live right. It helps us to realize that, you know what? We've got to live righteously. We've got to live soberly in this world. The knowledge of the end times are not a bunch of facts that we are to be known, but it's a truth that is to be lived. 1 John chapter 2, 3, verses 2 to 3 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, Jesus Christ, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And by the way, thank God, we need to see him as he is. We don't see him as he is. We see him as, 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 as you know, he's nothing more than a, a, a flowery stuffed pillow to most Christians. Some, some little uh, spiritual good luck charm. We really don't know Jesus for who he really is. Then it says this in verse 3. And every man that hath this hope in him, the hope that someday he'll appear, he will come and we will be with him, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. These people say, well, I can have a close relationship with Jesus, and I can just do whatever I want. You don't know the Jesus I know. You're not waiting for the Jesus that I'm waiting for. Because it says when we see him, he, because he is pure, we'll want to be like him. We're going to want to live the way he wants to live. Now, back to, this, back to the, the, the verses we read. These verses, Jesus is speaking to his disciples about the end times. It was a subject that they would have been a little bit foggy on. Remember, the Old Testament talks about the, 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 the passages, the, what's going to happen in the end time. It, it doesn't have the church age in there. The time from when the church started, <clears throat> when Christ was on this earth at his, at his death, <clears throat> until we're raptured away out of this world. That, that part was not seen. That's the mystery the New Testament talks about. He's speaking, <clears throat> excuse me, primarily about his second coming. And when he sets up his kingdom. But as he is looking forward to the time, he teaches them to look backwards. Now, I know primarily in these verses he's talking to the, to the Jews who will be waiting for the second coming when Jesus physically comes to this earth because they're not saved, they're not part of the, the church, they're not going to be raptured. But as he's talking about these whole end time scenarios, he points them back to two Old Testament events to teach them <clears throat> about how they can be prepared during this whole excuse me, my throat's a little dry, a little whole end time scenario. The two, the two different uh, um, events he mentions are the times of Noah and Lot's wife, or the time that God took care of Sodom and Gomorrah. He wants them to think about those times. The first, when he's talking about the days of Noah, takes them back to that wicked time and how people lived in complete unpreparedness for what was going to happen. The people in Sodom had no clue what was coming. They lived their wicked, godless, perverse lifestyle, not knowing that God was going to, to really blow up the whole city. The second is, uh, I'm sorry, that's, uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's Lot's wife, is Noah, when, when they just lived not knowing the flood was coming or a, a ignoring Noah's uh, admonition that it was coming. And Lot's wife, when, in Sodom and Gomorrah, when that was coming. The people of that time didn't get it. Now, by the way, when we think back to those times, the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, the times before the flood, the times are just, the, the, those societies were just like our societies. Fact of the matter is, in some instances, our society's worse because the access to these things are, is so much easier. The promotion of the things are just so much you know, look, I read a book 19, when I was a new Christian, like 1981. It was a book by a man named Leonard Ravenhill. It was called Sodom Had No Bible. 
And his whole thing, he, and his whole premise in the book was about how wicked our society is now. And really, Sodom, even though they were wicked and judged by God, they didn't even have a scripture to follow. And yet our society, as wicked as it is, we know some of the truth, and it's been thrown out there. That was 1980. That's child's play compared to what is happening in our society today. The people of those times, just as the people in our times, are just carrying on with the ordinary things of life. Just their everyday affairs. Oblivious to the fact that one day they will stand before God. One day their life will be over. One day they will give account. People, I've heard people over there, so you invite them to church. I am too busy for church. One day they're going to regret that they ever said that. They let the cares of this world squeeze God out of their thoughts and out of their schedule. These were societies that were drenched in immorality. You want to look at the time of Lot, you want to look back to Noah's days, they were pornographic in nature. By the way, our society has taken that to a whole new level. We have. It's everywhere. Immorality is used to sell everything. You know, people dress in such a way that, that, that they'd have been considered harlots. We were uh, somewhere and they had a, a uh, I saw an old, a book of, of Long Beach, early 1900s. And they were showing ladies at the beach. Don't take this wrong. They were dressed at the beach in the 1900s more modestly than most women dress in church. They would get tickets for dressing immodestly at the beach. People, you know what people wear to the beach today, Brother Pichardo? Colored underwear. And, and no one sees anything wrong with that. Now, if a lady walked around in just her, and I, I hope this isn't vulgar, but stay with me. If she just walked around in society in her underwear, that we would, we would say, hey, why are you doing that? But if you paint it colors and put polka dots on it, it's okay. That's our society. The immorality and all the nonsense. It's in the movies. It's in advertising. There was a confusion in those times with homosexuality. Now, I know the argument. It's love. It doesn't matter who the people are as long as they love one another. Hey, what if it was a brother and sister that loved one another? What if it was a, a father and a daughter who love one another? Well, no, no, that's wrong. Oh, so you do believe some things are wrong. Can I just tell you something? Not only is that wrong, it's not natural. Well, I just believe that, you know, I'm a man. Well, I am. Uh, you know, some guy, I believe I'm a woman. It is uncompassionate not to treat that person as somebody that has some problems that need to be helped. To tell them, look, if I get up here and said, hey, I just want to let you know, I'm the Easter Bunny. I identify as a rabbit. You would say, something's wrong with that guy. Well, you probably say that already, but I'd give you a reason to say it now. If I got up here and said, you know what? I'm a woman. There's something wrong with me. That doesn't mean I should be able to go to Target and use the ladies' restroom. Okay? But in our society, that's okay. We're confused. By the way, in California, if you work specifically, if you work at a, um, the type of facility that pastor's in, I don't know if they're uh, enforcing it yet, but it's passed, and you accidentally call somebody by the gender pronoun that they have decided they want you to call them, you go to jail. It's in the books. That's our society. We're warped. They have this new uh, Anne of Green Gables. Listen, I, I hope you don't, I don't lose manhood points, but I have watched that with my daughters in the past. Okay? What are you going to do? You got girls. Okay? They made a new one. And they're making all of the characters gay and transgendered. By the way, they weren't like that in the 1800s. 
but they're trying to change society. That was a time of very violent and law, of violent activity and lawless behavior. Isn't that like, you know, we celebrate, we celebrate, uh, we celebrate athletes who are very violent. Do you know in the NFL, I, I, I heard a statistic. On average, an NFL player is arrested every seven days. You know, some guy does something and he's horrible, but, but Ray Lewis can kill somebody and it's okay because he plays football really good. That's one of my pet peeves. But lawlessness. By the way, criminals have all the rights. Occultism. Fascination. All this, and if you have this, I'm not getting on you, but, but, but you need to study where it came from. All this body piercing and, and, and you know, my body is a canvas. You know, be very careful about that. You got to see, see where that came from. Now, sometimes, you know, you like the Raiders or something and something happened in the past. I get it. Materialism. You know, it's all about what I have. And then perversion. Perversion. Our society is perverse. And you know what they think? And if you think something that is perverse is perverse, they think you're weird. Sounds a lot like our day, doesn't it? There was careless and apathy towards God. A complete perversion of spiritual beliefs. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. I'm going to quote them. If you want to go there, you can, but I'll, I'll read them to you. He says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. You know who the society of people that call themselves, the majority of people call themselves Christians, the kind of preacher they want to hear? They want to hear someone that's going to just tell them something cute, but they're not going to tell them anything that's the truth. Don't, don't look, Joel Osteen. You, you, by the way, the Presbyterian, some of these other denominations, now they have not just lady preachers, but lesbians and homosexuals. There's a guy, many years ago, I, I heard a bunch of Christians tell this, this guy's book is great. It was a guy named Timothy Keller, and he, he wrote a book about God or something about knowing God. And Oh, that's a wonderful book. Listen, that, that, guy, that guy promotes homosexuality. And he was very, very well promoted in Christian circles. What is wrong with us? You know what's wrong with us? If you look at our society, we're as in the days of Noah. We're just like before Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, say, where are you going with all this? I don't know. I'm just really irritated today. Just kidding. It's old-fashioned day, so we're going to give it. There was a thinking in the days of Noah, and particularly in Lot's wife. That's why he lifted up his example. Hey, it's like the days of Noah. We've got to think about that. But remember Lot's wife. What was some of the thinking that was prevalent in their day that I think is that we sometimes slips into our mentality? I think I have six thoughts. They will not be long. Number one, here's one thinking. The thinking that we can disregard Bible commands and get away with it. Okay? In Genesis chapter number 19. You might want to flip over there. We're going to look at some verses there. Genesis chapter 19. And we'll look at verse 17, and I'll allude to a few other verses. See, we see the Bible, as I mentioned this morning, as something that's optional. You know, I don't, you know, if I feel like, if I agree with what God says, I'll do it. If I don't agree, I can just kind of like, nah, you know, I don't, I don't, I'll just do my own thing. You can do that, but really, you can't get away with it. Genesis 19, 17, it came to pass that when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Verse 26. And it says, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. I mean, the command was given straight out. And it was given straightforward. Do not look back. That's not an option. Don't do it. If you do it, you're going to get it. I always thought to myself, why did she look back? Did she wanna did she wanna die? If she wanted to die, she should have just stayed in the city. She she's like, well, you know, the city's gonna be destroyed if I leave. So she had enough faith to walk out of the city, but she 
look back anyhow. I don't think that she really thought that if she looked back that things were going to end badly. I just don't believe that. Or else she would have realized she was committing suicide. Damaged Christian, I, I can do what I want. The Bible's not, you know, commands. We don't like commands. <laughs> don't go all legalistic on me, bro. Legalism? God has a right to tell you what to do. You know, I just, sometimes the church there, you guys are just a little too straightforward. I, you know, I can't live up to the church standard. You don't have to live up to the church standards. Live up to the biblical standards. Okay? Th that's that. But we don't like it. And we think, I don't have to do it, and everything will be just okay. Doesn't work that way. You can't disobey. Let me just make this really clear. You cannot willingly sin against God. You cannot willingly sin against God and get away with it. But I'm saved, bro. Jesus and I, man, I'm going to heaven. And you're probably going to get there a lot faster. Hey, if you're saved, your sin's no longer going to take you to hell. Amen. But it's going to be a rocky road there. Because God doesn't give us the option. You can choose whether or not you obey, but you cannot choose the consequences. Now, by the way, before I move on, all sin is sin. But there's a difference between me getting up with brother, uh, getting upset with Brother Bachardo and saying something mean-spirited to him, just being flat sinning against him with my mouth, and me thinking about doing something that's wrong, and I have a chance not to do it, and I choose to do it anyhow. Do you know the difference? The anger of a moment versus the choice. There's just something bad about when you know something is wrong, and you willingly choose to do it anyhow. I don't want to walk down that road. And you may, look, and Satan will tell you, listen, God will forgive you. And then the second you do it, he says, what a lousy Christian you are. Don't buy into it. Listen, don't willingly sin. There's a lot of things you can do successfully in life, but let me just tell you one thing you can't. If you're a Christian, you can never sin successfully. You know, I just, you know, I just have to lie at work over here so that my boss will lay off my back, but it'll be okay. No, it won't. It'd be better for you to tell your boss the truth and get fired than for you to lie and keep your job. It's better to keep your character than to keep your job. And I have a feeling your boss would be okay with you for being honest. Number two, the thinking that we can ignore God's grace and get away with it. In verse 16, when he was taking them out of Genesis 19, he, the, the angel said, uh, the Bible says, the Lord being merciful unto him. They literally had to say, come on, let's get out of here and almost pull him out by the hand. The Bible says God was merciful to them in doing that. And then a verse we said kind of parallels the rapture. In verse 22, he says, uh, Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. He says, God can't judge the city. There's nothing he can do because you're in it. You got to get out of here. Can I just tell you something? That's God's grace. Now, if I was an angel, I would have said, Hey, God's going to destroy the city. Just come. Well, you know, I don't know. It's like, All right, see you later. If that, you want to stay in the city, have a good time. Look, I'm not messing around. I'm leaving. You coming? God was gracious to them. God took them out of the city. And yet, she ignored God's grace in getting her out from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and put herself in a place by disobeying him that she became a pillar of salt. So the results were the same. It just happened in a different way and at a different time. Do you understand God's grace in your life? Not just the grace that saves you, thank God for that. But the grace that after we're saved gives us the power to live the way God wants us to live. And yet, you know what we constantly do? We spit in God's, God's uh, face and we, just, uh, we uh, abuse his grace. So you see, there are two ways we can look at grace. We can look at grace as not just uh, the eternal salvation of our souls, but the opportunity for a new and better life on this earth a changed life, a transformed life. Or we could just see it as an excuse to continue sinning. 
That's the generation that we're in. Judges, uh, I'm sorry, Jude, verse 4. It's only one chapter. If you look for chapter 2, you're never going to find it. It says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. Why were they ungodly? Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you can tell how someone's not straight up in their Bible beliefs. If they think the grace of God is an excuse to do what they want in life, that's not the kind of person you ought to listen to. Well, bro, I'm under grace. Hey, I'm under grace too. Well, what does that mean? You know, I just, you know, hey, I, I, I got a beer in my hand. I'm under grace, brother. No, you're going to be under the condemnation of God for drinking something he says you should not be drinking. Turning. Turning the grace of our God. Turning means this, to change or transfer. To make it something it's not. That's pretty point blank. We're taking the tr grace of God and we're changing it into something it was never designed to be. When someone's trying to push grace at you, it's, it's okay, you're saved, just go do what you want. You're under God's grace. It's all good. Put the bumper sticker. Carry your Bible around. Dust it weekly. They're taking God's grace and they're taking something that is meant to help us to be what God wants us to be and changing it to encourage us to be what we want to be. And that's not what it is. Lascivious, lasciviousness means unbridled lust or excess. Just doing what you want. Grace, God's grace doesn't, doesn't do that. Number three, the thinking that we can <clears throat> hold to this world and get away with it. I'm sure as Lot's wife was walking out of the city, they lived there for many years. By the way, they had daughters there that didn't leave. Son-in-laws. And usually with those come maybe some grandkids. Friends of a lifetime. All the memories of what was going on when they lived there. And I don't know if she heard what was going on and she's walking out of the city. Maybe that allurement to everything that she had, had known before and, and all of that, maybe it was just too strong for her. She had to look back and see what was going on. She was judged for. A lot of times when we look back, you know what happens? We turn back. It's hard to look back without starting to turn back. Okay? We're not supposed to look back at the world. This world is very slick. It makes that which is wrong look right, that which is bad look good, and that which is wicked look right. And we buy into it. You cannot love the world and love God at the same time. You know, the world truly mocks biblical Christianity. They do. Uh, you, if you were to watch Leave it to Beaver or some of these older shows, they had a respect for morals and, and gods. And if they showed a pastor, you know, he was a decent man or whatever. Now, I hope you don't watch it, but I know our society, they mock that type of thing. If someone's, if someone's a pastor or whatever, you know, he, he, he's a money-grabbing, you know, whatever. They just mock Christianity. And yet that's who we want to team up with? You, you, the two don't go together. There has to be a separation from that. The Bible makes it clear to the Christian that this world is, uh, is, is un, off limits to the godly Christian. 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, I'm not going to tell you the things of the world. We've went over it. But he just says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, and I'm, this is just, you say, I don't, I don't like this. I know, but God wrote it, not me. The love of the Father is not in him. If you choose to love what our wicked society peddles, I didn't say this. I'm too nice. God said it. He says, then God's love isn't in you at all. We know, let's just, some churches, let's just back up on what we're doing because we just want to love people. Okay, if you've got to love people, you've got to have God's love. And if we're bringing the world into the church, we don't have the love of God, so we don't love people. Let that sink in for a minute. 
We're just going to make church like, you know, we'll give some slick advertising campaign. Everybody will be cool. We'll bring in the type of music. We'll play the videos. Uh, you, you be, the churches play like secular music in their services. What is wrong with that? That's ridiculous. Just trying to reach people, man. Good. Reach them with God's truth. Somebody I knew, and they, they changed their whole direction of their church. Baptist off the church, whole different direction. Why'd you do that? You know, I just, I just want to love people. I'm like, if you didn't love people because your church was a Baptist church, that's a you problem. It had nothing to do with the name of your church. How, it, it, loving people means you share the truth. You don't hide the truth. That's unloving. Number four. The thinking that we can look behind and get away with it. And again, this goes back to Lot's wife, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit harder. See, for those of us that got saved a little later on in life, we have a lot of things in our past, right? Some people were wicked, alcoholics, drug addicts, Raider fans, you name it. Just all the bad stuff you can just throw out there. Ate at McDonald's, drove Fords. Just throw it all out there. <laughs> we have all that stuff behind. But you know what happens sometimes? In a, in a moment of emotions, in a moment of discouragement, Satan will say, hey, look back. It wasn't that bad. You know, you're sitting eating somewhere. Look, I, I can eat somewhere, and they're playing rap music in the background, if, as long as it's not loud. You know, it's like, Brother Charles, it doesn't speak to me. I, I, can, I totally ignore it. But you know, something comes on, dun, 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 dun. it's like, well, wait a minute, I know that one. That resonates. You know why? It's my past. You know, we got to look up our old girlfriends. Look up our old boyfriends. If you, have a, you know, had a boyfriend, I hope you were a girl at least. You know, our old friends. The things we used to do. The places we used to go. We start thinking about what we used to be involved with. And you know what Satan does? He has a way of helping us to erase the bad things. Man, it was exciting back when I did that. But what about the consequences of it? You're forgetting that. You know, it's like the, the Israels in, in, when they were coming out of Egypt, like, we should have went back to Egypt. When we, went, when we were in Egypt, we ate well, and, and everything was good. We ate melons and leeks, and it was a salad bar, and it was a buffet. No, it wasn't. It was forced labor, and you weren't paid. You were beaten. You had no freedom. But Satan just kind of wiped that part out. We forget all the nonsense. Be very careful. If you want to look back to your past, here's, some, here's what you should remember. Remember the guilt you had when you sinned. Remember how you felt the next morning. Remember how you used to think about yourself. Remember all the drama that was in your life. All of that stuff. Remember how you had, you had no clue as to what was going on in your life. You're just living day to day. You had no hope for the future. Remember that. And we'll be all right. But we look back and remember the wrong things. Number five, the thinking that we can reject Christ's message and get away with it. Second Peter chapter 5. Uh, ch chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. It says this about Noah. Talking again about the, the, the world. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example. Now, it took Noah 120 years to, to, to build the ark. You say, why did it take them 120 years? Building permits, you know, all those type of things, city interference. You know how it is. Because <laughs> it was a big project. The ark, the ark was not some little sailboat. It was not a uh, catamaran, okay? It was a big boat that all the animals would fit in. But as he was doing that, he preached for 120 years. You know how many converts he had? Counting the two from last Sunday. Zero! 
his, his family. That was it. No one listened. The truth was there. They could have got it. No one wanted to hear it. They mocked, I'm sure. That message didn't, hey, when I'm done with this boat, it's going to rain. And when it rains, God's going to flood this whole world. And everybody's going to be wiped out. You better get ready to meet God. And they're like, what is rain? Try preaching about something that doesn't exist. And they're like, they didn't get it. And they thought that they could hear the message. They could hear the truth. And that they could ignore it. And that they would get away with it. People don't listen today. Now, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes, because I'm a nice guy, I might say something, particularly in the morning service, you have someone visit. I don't, they don't like it. I'm like, why not? I know. I, they, I, they, oh. <laughs> like, ouch, you're hurting me. It's like, we told you the truth. That, that, I mean, you know, now, now, if I say something, and if, if you're a Raider fan, I'm saying something about the Raiders. I'm kidding. So, so don't, don't, that's not in the Bible. I've looked, though. But, you know, if there's something that's a truth in the Bible, getting up and getting mad at me or whoever, your Sunday school teacher, oh, dare you say that. You, you can't, it's truth. Truth is truth. Say, well, I don't like it. I don't like a lot of it either. My flesh, in fact, doesn't like any of it. But you know what it is? It's the truth. And just because we don't like the truth, we feel we can ignore the truth, and we'll get away with it. Christ has told us about life. He's talked to us about abundant life. I think that's on this earth. But yet people are like, oh, come on, the Bible says this. The Bible, I've got a better way. See how that works for you. I'm just, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck here. I'm not trying to be sarcastic, but I've seen how that works. The better path is God's path. The things that you truly need in your heart, the real important things of life, they come from following God. Yet yeah, people don't want to hear that. Now, I know the church, you guys, I was walking around when I was doing all the friend day stuff and I met a lady. I came to your church. I'm not coming anymore. You know, I was like, why? Don't you like me? I don't ask that question because I already know the answer in advance. <laughs> nope. could never live what your church says. I'm like, you know, I didn't want to argue with her. I'm like, oh, come on. Come on. You can come back. No. I thought she was going to hit me with her handbag. It's like, listen, it's not what the church is saying. You know what I'm saying? It, it's, if it's the truth of the Bible... We don't, have a whole lot of, we don't have a whole lot of choice in that matter. Oh, actually, we do. Yes or no. He also told us the truth about eternal life. By the way, I am sure some people struggle in their Christianity because they've not settled that. I'm sure of it. And I wouldn't let anything keep me from getting saved. Could you imagine a person... Maybe heard the gospel one time and they go to hell. That's going to bother them for all eternity. But could you imagine somebody who sits in church? They've heard the truth of the scripture. They've heard the truth of the gospel. They've heard the invitations. And on and on and on and on. And yet they never get saved. You know, we had a girl in our church many years ago. A mom. Mom saying. And... She had become, and she started getting a little trouble, so we sent her off to, Hepsa, I think it was Hepzibah House. And she went to Hepzibah House, and she was there for several years, and she came back, and she was a changed girl. I mean, she was complete. She had a bad, ad, I remember before we sent her to the home, she was sitting in our living room, and my wife was talking to her, like, what's going on with you? And she's just like, I got a bad attitude. And she told me, I ain't changing. And I'm like, okay, whoa. She came back totally different girl just changed one day she called my wife and said <laughs> she said uh, I got saved this morning and we're thinking now wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute you you came back and you here was her story 
There's a lot of truth to this story. She had a dream that night. And in her dream, she knew she wasn't saved when she came back, but she was embarrassed to say anything. And she said, she's like, I had this dream, and in my dream, I realized I needed to get saved, and I knew I needed to get saved. So I called you, Miss Alma, but you were on the phone, and you couldn't talk to me. <laughs> you know, sometimes dreams are true. So then in her dream, she called me. And in, my, in her dream, I witnessed to her. She got saved in her dream, and then she woke up, and she already knew what she needed to do to get saved, and she trusted Christ. You know, that sent shockwaves through the youth group. We had several other kids get saved. They were like, this girl has, was completely changed, outwardly one of the best kids there, and it was like, she got saved? It made everybody question their salvation. I almost got saved again. But the point is this, we hear the truth and it's gonna be sad if we don't follow it. What about you tonight? Do you think that you can just do what you want and get away with it? It didn't work for them and it's not gonna work for you. Let's stand it this evening.